Tonight on The Best Times, we take a walk through history at the oldest active cemetery in Memphis and hear the stories of the people buried there. And we'll chat with ageless marketing guru, John Malmo. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. Bob Dylan once drew inspiration from an ancient cemetery in New Orleans. As he walked between the Greek and Romanesque tombstones, the Egyptian obelisks, and the ornate mausoleums, he was inspired to write, the past doesn't pass away so quickly here. And so it is with Elmwood Cemetery, the oldest active cemetery in Memphis. It's a place where you can find history at rest. It is fitting that to enter Elmwood Cemetery, you must cross over a bridge, symbolically separating the land of the living from those who have passed over. Elmwood is on the National Register of Historic Places, as is the cottage, built in 1866, and the bridge. The cemetery was founded in 1852 on 40 acres of land, two and a half miles outside the city limits. Its manicured grounds and park-like setting stood in stark contrast to the filth of the city. But once you made the trip into the cemetery grounds, um, you were, you know, you entered another world. The cemetery was designed to be um, an oasis, a, a true Victorian garden cemetery, and uh, really give people that respite from the dirtiness of downtown at that time. And there were 75 thousand people buried in Elmwood, individuals who have their own story. And Elmwood is an active cemetery, so we've got room for about 10,000 more burials. History is everywhere at Elmwood. Walk among the tombstones and you'll find veterans of every American war here. There are mayors, governors, and senators buried alongside madams, outlaws, and ordinary citizens. And every grave tells a story. The Victorians wanted you to know something about them just by looking at their monument. And most of the big monuments that are here that are old tell a story of that person's life. A huge white obelisk is prominently positioned just inside the gates of Elmwood. It's a fitting location for one of Memphis's most famous and infamous politicians. Boss Crump, as many know, was the mayor of Memphis four times and elected to the U.S. House of Representatives once. And he was the strong arm of Memphis with a, with a very pleasant demeanor and um, ran state politics for a very long time. Uh, but he does rest here along with the rest of the Crump family. One of the most photographed statues in Elmwood belongs to Wade Hampton Bolton, a cotton merchant and slave trader who had a falling out with his business partner, Tom Dickens. That led to a violent feud between the two men's families that lasted for seven years. Seven people in the family uh, lost their lives. Some were shot, one was set on fire, um, another was stabbed, or another was poisoned. It was a pretty salacious story for the time. Ultimately, Bolton's business partner shot him in the shoulder. 
but instead of seeking life-saving medical treatment, Bolton died, leaving Tom Dickens to face murder charges. In his will, he asked for a stately monument bearing his name, but look closely at his likeness. If you look at it, visitors will see that his vest is buttoned wrong, his shoelaces are untied, um, his hand is behind his back, and a Victorian man would never have been seen as depicted with a hand behind his back. It suggested duplicity. And uh, he's also seen leaning on a cane, which um, related a sign of weakness. After the Civil War, Elmwood doubled in size to 80 acres to accommodate the war dead. Over 20 generals from North and South lie at rest here. Most of the 700 Union soldiers once buried here have been moved, but over a thousand Confederate dead are interred beneath the Confederate monument. In another corner of Elmwood, you'll find a seemingly empty tract of land devoid of any gravestones. An historic marker tells the story of over 1,400 unidentified Memphians buried in slit trenches in the area called No Man's Land. They were the victims of the yellow fever epidemics of the 1870s. So many people were perishing in Memphis, especially during 1878, that Elmwood Cemetery was accommodating 50 burials a day. Maddie Stevenson was a young woman living in central Illinois when she read the news of the yellow fever outbreak of 1873. She came down to the city and she um, began nursing the sick. Unfortunately, she caught the fever herself and within two weeks uh, perished herself. She was buried here in the no man's land section of Elmwood. And the citizens of Memphis were ultimately so moved by her act of generosity that they donated a, monu a beautiful monument in her memory. Over 5,000 Memphians died in a matter of weeks during the yellow fever epidemic of 1878. On hearing of the first case of the fever, Dr. James Armstrong sent his entire family away from the city, but he stayed, along with a handful of other brave doctors who tended to the sick and dying as best they could. Dr. Armstrong contracted the fever and died in September of that year. Annie Cook and Fanny Walker were also heroines of the yellow fever epidemic, even though their occupation put them in a very different social strata than Dr. Armstrong. Annie Cook, she uh, lost her life in 1878 when she turned her bordello into a makeshift hospital and administered um, nursing to the citizens of Memphis who had nowhere else to go. Another of them is Emily Sutton, who was known professionally as Fanny Walker in her life, and uh, she's buried up in the near the Leno Circle section of Elmwood, a very nice section with a beautiful monument. Um, the cemetery, um, you know, allowed her monument to be put up with her name given to her, given that was given to her at birth, but they did not want anyone to forget who she was in life, and forced the. Um, the estate to put Fanny Walker on curbstones around her gravesite. Along with the saints buried at Elmwood, there are the scoundrels. Take the story of Alma Feed. She was known um, colloquially as Vance Avenue Alma. Uh, she worked in bars on Vance Avenue, and so that's where she was kind of known. She ended up being brought up on murder charges, not once, but three times in her life because she was accused of killing three of her seven husbands. She was able to um, live out a very long life and people kept marrying her, so she must have had something going for her. For trivia buffs, the tallest and largest monument is a pink granite obelisk that sits atop the grave of William Green Thomas. And the oldest grave in Elmwood? Well, that's actually a trick question. Colonel John Smith fought in the Revolutionary War and died before Elmwood was founded. His remains were moved here when the old Winchester Cemetery downtown was closed. Nevertheless, he holds the honor of the oldest grave in Elmwood. The cemetery is a level two arboretum with over 1,400 trees, some over 300 years old. And trees are the topic of another bit of trivia. A drawing was held in 1852 to name the cemetery, and Elmwood was pulled out of a hat. Everyone was pleased with the name until someone pointed out that there were no elm trees on the property. 
So the founders quickly purchased elm trees in New York and planted them here. Today you'll find a number of elm trees casting their shade on the graves below. Because there is so much history buried here, Elmwood holds regular events and gives tours to share this remarkable piece of Memphis's heritage with the public. Stroll around on a tour and you can find the mausoleum of Robert Church, the first African-American millionaire in the South. Sister Thea Bowman is known for bringing traditional African-American blues music into the Catholic Church. And fittingly, historian and author Shelby Foote is buried here. What better place for a historian to spend eternity? Every good story starts at Elmwood Cemetery. If you want to learn the history of the city of Memphis, you have to start at Elmwood. If you're a listener of FM 91, and I hope you are, you'll recognize the voice of advertising and marketing guru, John Malmo, who delivers his regular branding commentary over the station's airwaves. John has been an ad man for the majority of his career, and now, at age 83, he's not stopping. I'd like you to meet John Malmo. John, I know a lot of viewers will recognize your voice from FM 91, but now you're here in person. Um, I read that one of your earliest jobs was as a door-to-door -door fuller brush salesman. Yes, it was. That must have been an adventure. Well, it was. I did it the summer of between my freshman and sophomore years in college. And uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was very lucrative. Uh, fuller brush men, if they worked hard, made a lot of money. Uh, and they had a very simple formula uh, that every, every six doors you knocked on, you made a sale. And they knew what the average sale was. And a fuller brush man made 51% commission on what he sold. Uh, and, I mean, I probably made more per hour uh, that year at age 18 than I did for the next 10 or 15 years. <laughs> you probably learned a lot about <laughs> advertising and marketing by selling those brushes. Well, you know what I really, the most valuable lesson I learned was to do what they told me to do. Uh, because your training consisted of one day with a super salesman. You figured out how many houses you were going to call on the next day. So in the afternoon, you went and you dropped a catalog at the doorstep of all those houses. And then when you got to the front door, <clears throat> you said, uh, I'm a fuller brush man. Which one of my free samples would you like, the handy vegetable brush or the unbreakable pocket comb? And nobody turns you down. Everybody would take one. And then I would say, I know you got the catalog I left last night. What interests you the most? The toothbrush special on page 11 here or this, uh, this uh, broom special on page 3? Uh, you know, you learn never to answer a closed-end question. Uh, and I just did what they told me to, and it worked. And it led to a long, long career in advertising. Why did you, why'd you choose advertising? <clears throat> what attracted you to that? I was thinking about that the other day, <laughs> and I, th I, I, think it had so I think it had something to do with birth order. Uh, I was the fourth uh, in a family of four children, and if, if you're the fourth of four, uh, y you have no presence. Uh, you, you just kind of at the tail end. And uh, I think that uh, uh, I was interested in having a presence. And uh, so I started being interested in writing very early. Uh, originally, I wanted to be a newspaper editor. And so I spent the first five or six years of my career in the newspaper business. But uh, then I was getting ready to get married. And I didn't want to work for the afternoon paper, and if I worked for the morning paper, you had to work at night. 
And so I decided uh, to try to get into public relations, advertising, and... Uh, better hours. That's, that was the whole motivation, better be hours. Better hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you're a copy guy. That's uh, basically, that's all right. right. So <clears throat> do you have uh, a favorite headline, a favorite ad that you've done in your many years? Well, the most successful I ever wrote was Big Mac, 49 cents. Uh, <laughs> which, which is pretty basic, John. <laughs> my, one of my favorites was for uh, an electric fishing motor called Motor Guide. Uh, and uh, the issue with those initially uh, with electric fishing motors was that they didn't have much power. And this one happened to be fairly powerful. So we went out and found three guys that weighed over 300 pounds. We put them in an aluminum John Boat sent them out fishing, and we wrote a headline that said, uh, Rub-a-dub-dub, we have more tug. <laughs> or no, Motor Guide has more tug. That was the brand. Uh, that is a good headline. That well, is it, it, uh, Motor Guide became the number one seller. It was a very successful product. Well, what makes a good ad? You know, people talk about good advertising and bad advertising, and I, I prefer to use the terms the right advertising and the wrong advertising. Uh, uh, really, the right ad uh, recognizes, identifies a need, and and puts the product or the service in the way of the need as a solution, and makes it clear quickly to a reader or a listener or a viewer that it's doing that. So, so what drives you? Do you consider yourself a workaholic? Oh no. No. No, I, no. Well, then, I, what drives you? Why do you? Why, at age eighty-three, are you still doing this? Uh, well, first of all, I really do like to help uh, a company or an individual uh, who is trying to make something happen uh, in a company. And I now, especially, I have lived long enough uh, that I have really an enormous amount of experience just in knowing what's a waste of time, what's a waste of money, and what's not. And it's uh, that's very valuable. And I hate to, uh, I would hate to take it home and shut the door on it. Do you think continuing to work keeps you young? Oh, I definitely think it does. In what yeah. way? Well, <clears throat> it... In the first place, I work all day with, uh, in an office with about 175 people, almost all of whom are in their 20s and 30s. Uh, and it, it's uh, very refreshing, and it helps me particularly now in the digital world uh, because it took me a while uh, to accept computers and the Internet and, and, and its importance, and it, now it's... It's, it's dominance, uh, but everything is visual. Uh, it's a picture. Uh, it's not words that uh, I, I guess, I guess we're reverting to the days in which cavemen <laughs> drew pictures on the walls of their caves, and as we're going back to that only at the speed of light. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about entrepreneurship, because you were one of the founding members of the Society of Entrepreneurs. Um, and I know a lot of viewers may be thinking about, at their age, becoming an entrepreneur, taking on a new career, a second career, an encore career. What advice would you have for a budding entrepreneur in their 50-plus years? The good thing is that unlike, the, unlike our daddies and our grandfathers, uh, we have the internet, and the internet makes it possible today. Everything you, everything you look at that comes out, every new thing that is really successful, in almost every case, you can look at it and say, you know, I knew that. I knew we needed that. Uh, if, if I could have done that. Uh, my, my favorite example always has been uh, that... Uh, uh, the, they, the, for years, they ask women uh, what problems they have with opening cereal boxes. And the women said, oh, we don't have any problem with opening a cereal box. 
we just take a kitchen knife, we jab it in the side, and we saw it around the top. And But some guy finally went into a kitchen and watched that happen and said, we got to be able to do better than that. <laughs> and so somebody changed the, the design of cereal boxes. He, represented, he recognized the need. There are lots of needs out there right now. If you can recognize one of them and figure out a solution, you, don't, you have the Internet, which solves 90% of the problems for an entrepreneur. And, and you can advertise internationally on Facebook for a few dollars. So I get the sense that you're saying now is the best time. Now be is honest. absolutely the best time for somebody who can, who can recognize a real need and figure out a solution and then figure out how to put it into the, the, uh, the how to put it in the format for the internet. Now you're a big, uh, you're on the board of More Tech, yes. More Tech College, uh, and I know you are a big proponent of the skilled blue, blue collar jobs. So let's talk about that a little bit, because you believe, what did you say earlier about those jobs? You believe they were the... Uh, well, I, I believe it's, it, it, it's the best road to wealth for probably uh, more young Memphis men and women than anything else. And I give these two examples. Uh, it, it, Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones, uh, one of them has a daughter and the other one has a son, uh, and one of them uh, he sends off uh, to... Uh, say the University of Tennessee in Knoxville uh, and that uh, child gets a bachelor's degree uh, the the family spends a hundred thousand dollars a hundred and fifty thousand dollars somewhere in that neighborhood uh, and the, and the child comes home after four years and he goes into the bank uh, training program becomes a bank teller works through the bank training program and retires probably gets up to be a vice president in charge of loans and that sort of thing and and has a nice retirement and that's it the other one child goes to more tech uh, gets a, an associate degree in two years for uh, let's say HVAC heating and air conditioning uh, the father spends 25 thousand dollars let's say for the two years dad pulls some of that money out that he didn't spend for the other two years in college and buys the young man a truck and the equipment he needs and he starts his own company and he works hard and he grows the company and at age 60 he sells it for five million dollars the easiest way to create wealth is in your own business. And the best way to be in your own business is, we think, through one of the trades. I always ask guests who reach a certain age um, about their words of wisdom. What would your words of wisdom be to, to viewers? Well, if it has to do with marketing or advertising, I, I could be helpful. I, I'm not sure. What about sure. life? Not so helpful with life? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. I think, I think probably, uh, probably it's, it's, it's very genetic. Uh, I, I think that I got good genes that, that have given me a body and a mind that allow me to still be working at 83, and a lot of my... Uh, friends uh, and, and past friends would love it, but uh, their genes didn't work for them the way mine do. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I think staying active, uh, uh, not, not just, you know, going to the gym and, and uh, doing that sort of thing. Uh, I, I know that uh, their doctors tell them, tell all of us that that's what we should do, and I'm sure that's important to keep your body in shape. Uh, but I, I think it's just as important uh, to keep your mind in shape. And I, and I think it's hard when you get out of a daily work routine. 
Uh, I think it's very, very hard. And so, you know, maybe, maybe the Internet is the answer to that. John, thanks very much for being on the show. My pleasure. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.